All right. Yeah, as I said, and I think my, oh, here we go. I get the full screen. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Inside Ashoka. Uh, my name is Simon Stump. My pronouns are he and him. I'm on the Ashoka team, and I'm joining you all from Wisconsin in the lands of the Ho-Chunk people. Uh, occurring roughly once a month, this is Inside Ashoka. It's a chance for our community to connect and to learn from our fellows. Uh, this week, or today, I should say, we're doing a slight variation on the theme. Typically, we're together for 30 minutes with one of our fellows. Today, we have three fellows, uh, newly elected to the Ashoka Fellowship, who will be sharing their stories and what they're seeing and how they're working for 45 minutes, as well uh, as on the 17th, where we'll be meeting another three or four new Ashoka fellows. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's also important for me to whew, acknowledge that we're joining you all today in grief and in anger over the loss of Black lives to racism and systemic injustice in this country. Uh, as my colleague Marina Kim of Ashoka U has shared, that uh, we acknowledge as well that these deaths happen against the backdrop of a pandemic, uh, which has caused a major health crisis, a heightened sense of physical distance and fear, uh, loss of life on a great scale, which has also disproportionately affected communities of color. And one of our fellows, who is going to join us today, Danielle Sered of Common Justice, is called to work more closely with her community and she won't be able to join us. Uh, her work, if I can just lift it up for a moment, is to interrupt the cycles of violence that are too often perpetuated by our police and criminal justice systems. So we are sending her our best thoughts, our, our good wishes, and just honoring uh, all the folks who couldn't be here uh, today uh, because you know, they're called to be in other places. Uh, and at the same time, acknowledging those of you who are here, uh, thanking you for making time out of your days to, to join us to learn from these Ashoka Fellows. Uh, your presence is a gift. Uh, we're really appreciating that we get to spend some time together this afternoon. Um, speaking of the presence of amazing people, uh, which I always experience as a gift and such an honor uh, here at Ashoka, I'm so excited for you all to meet Katie, Daquan, and Pervy who will also be joining us, uh, and she's just on her way. Hey, as if on cue. <laughs> uh, Herbie, I said your name, and you, and you popped in. Uh, I was just saying that we are really excited for folks to get to know you, and, uh, and also for you all to have this opportunity to share uh, the meaning, the, the learnings, and the really what we framed, the, the imagination, the visions for what could be better in a world that's definitely crying out for, for big solutions. Um, so with all of that, uh, we are gonna get to know some of these folks. I'm gonna uh, put the spotlight on you first, Mr. Oliver. Daquan, uh, actually just as we were joining, you were saying that your work isn't so much with schooling, but the concept of schooling. And something else that you've shared that has just really stuck with me is that our way of understanding schooling abhors chaos and really values control. Uh, and that is the thing that you have just set your sights on and are, are, are blowing up. Tell us a bit about uh, that environment of schooling, chaos control, and, and We Thrive, the programming that you introduced. Yeah, so you know, I'll start with just the concept of schooling in and of itself, right? Um, you know, so when we think about our own work in our education space, I think the number one we think about is, you know, where are all the places young people are learning, um, mm -hmm. especially in an instruction um, situation, right, where they can have the chance to either have a person who is an adult that is fostering um, potential autonomy, greatness, um, or who may actually be limiting it. Um, and the second, I'll actually talk about in a second, um, how specifically for the communities we serve, that may look different than other communities, but mm -hmm. at a high level, the, the concept of learning that we first kind of really concentric to is around that very concept of where are all the young people, where are all the ways that young people interact? So not just the classroom, but the after school setting, um, all the way to your YMCA program, all the way down to places like workforce and workforce investment readiness, right? And so um, where young people may actually learn um, their first jobs, et cetera. And when we think about each of those things, right, and especially as we are taught them as um, young humans, if you would, um, it's typically taught in a way of um, very rigor, control, um, very paced. Obviously, as we know, um, 
every single individual's pace is very different, right? And so, you know, for example, I might be amazing at math and biology, um, but perhaps something like um, history may be something I might move slower on for whatever reason, maybe that's interest, maybe that's uh, my own personal skill set, personality, et cetera. Now, um, what, what we kind of use entrepreneurship to do then, right? So our work, we equip underestimated youth to own their future. Um, our youth are really identifying a problem in their own communities and then seeing it into fruition and actually forming that company. We provide seed funding to make it happen. Now, within that process, it is a process that could not be controlled to the be any entrepreneur, um, any funder of an entrepreneur that might be on this call, et cetera, could tell you that. Um, and so through that very lens, we're reshaping two things, right? One is, of course, this element of schooling, how we might embrace um, young people and, and then that journey be forced to trust them, right? And trust the community members that are a part of that, which is critical for our work. Um, and at the same token, also um, use that as a, as a chance to reform the adult champion in that young person's life as well. Um, to that of what could be an instructor to more so someone who's more of a coach um, and therefore uh, direct support. Beautiful, Daquan. Uh, part of what you're up against, we, I mean, we set a pretty somber tone in the, in the opening of the call, the systems that are failing so many of us, uh, all of this now exacerbated by this isolation and, and distance that, that COVID in particular brings in. And your young people have, despite that and all these challenges, uh, flourished. I mean, you shared examples of young people really uh, staying together, staying close, embracing uh, this, uh, you know, moment of upheaval. Could you just like, wh what, uh, give us a, give us your favorite story of a young person uh, making, making change in the world today as part of We Thrive or in general? Yeah, I mean, there's just so many. Um, I was so bad because I can't name all of them, right? And so, I mean, just high level, I think one of them that's really sticking with me today, um, as soon as COVID started, one of our um, entrepreneur groups coming out of Maryland, um, you know, they had decided, they were already running and had launched their babysitting company in their community. Um, and so again, I'll, I'll just repeat, you know, with We Thrive, you know, that entrepreneurship has to be real, has to be practical. Um, you know, at the same time that we're, you know, disrupting education, we're also intentionally disrupting the way that economic prosperity works in this country. Um, and so, you know, these youth participants had already been in operation. Um, now, when COVID happened, as with all of us, they created a digital contingency. Um, and so they started doing virtual babysitting. So they were not only um, continuing to solve problems, but um, they were solving problems for individuals much older than themselves, which again, we, that's the kind of example we love where um, I think oftentimes we could put limits on what young people can do. Um, and here they were jumping on Zoom. Uh, perhaps you might have a child in the house where it's like you really need to take that call. Um, you, were, you were using their services um to actually go ahead and handle that and so you know just the innovation and the child genius there in and of itself and so that's the, one of the things that's really on my mind right now and they started first week first week of COVID I think it was like the week of March 11th or so awesome Daquan I want to thank you I mean I, I feel my heart breaks for so many young people who don't feel powerful and the school thing that happened just I feel like uh, really sapped folks sense of agency and power and, and yeah. but your your story is an antidote to that um, if I may, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over to Pervy. Uh, so good to see you, Pervy. Um, I would love to, I, we're clearly going to talk about the way your work lands in the world today. Uh, but first, I'd love to hear, and frankly, I, there's a, a frame that you brought um, to my attention, which is that you learned a new, you got hooked on a new style of lawyering. So your personal story uh, would be a, for me, would be a wonderful place to start. What is this new style of lawyering that you experienced uh, and, and then we'll talk about why it, how it can show up uh, in a big way. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for having, a, uh, having me and for listening in. Um, yeah, so my story is, you know, I, I think as a young person, I grew up, uh, you know, in an immigrant family seeing a lot of injustice in our communities and the way my parents were treated and the way our extended family, immigrant people had less education than my parents. and. And I think just was curious, you know, why does the world work this way? Why does it look like that? And as I became older, I studied and I looked at the history of movements and, you know, I realized something really powerful, which was um, the most, you know, 
extraordinary change in our society comes from the most ordinary people. And so for me, I think I started on this quest as a young person, just trying to understand the world, trying to understand what I saw in my own community, in my school, the disparity between my experiences and some of the kids I went to school with, speaking about schools, um, and just knowing that you know, opportun talent is, it is distributed equally, but we were not having equal experiences. And so, you know, on that journey, I ended up making my way to law school and studying law and politics. And when I got out of law school, you know, I returned to my hometown and I was very clear that I wanted to use my law degree to address these sort of intractable problems that many of us, I feel like we're just seeing the the wound of so many of these problems that we've not been able to resolve, the wound of racism, the wound of disparity. Um, and so when I got, when I started out as a young lawyer, the common sense that you are taught when you're in law school is the answers are in the books and the answers are in the courtroom and the judge is the decider and the law is objective, neutral, and fair. And my lived experiences told me otherwise. And when I got out and started practicing as a young legal services lawyers, the communities I worked in, their experiences proved otherwise. Um, and the truth was the, the law was not fair and what everything that was just um, was not legal or, or vice versa, everything that was harming our communities or wasn't a legal hook. So for me, it, it was like getting out of my office and going, I represented the taxi drivers, I represented uh, immigrants and uh, low-income people in public housing. And I think this idea that many people who are concerned with change is we're primarily concerned with what we can do. And, and I think what I learned in those early years is, is to put that aside for a second and to listen and to observe and to hear what people understand, the people closest to problems understand as those problems. And so getting out of the office and listening and really creating a space to hear both their understanding of the problem and their wisdom about what the solution to that problem is, allowed me to then think about how do I use my legal skills in service of that. And that approach, which, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it is an approach that's been sort of subterranean in the law, this idea of community lawyers or lawyers that are embedded in communities or movements. Um, and at the time I was coming out of law school about maybe about a 14 years ago, that was still a very marginal concept. And so for me, seeing this power of community and the vision and the talent, as Daquan is saying, and young people, like they, they know how to create the solutions to the problems they're living. Um, there's deep ingenuity and entre entrepreneurship in many of our communities. Um, how do we train a whole gen a whole army of lawyers that can work alongside communities that are trying to solve problems? Um, with their own strength and in their in their own imagination. One way you've described this challenge then is like so many lawyers or the, even the whole legal profession is sitting on the sidelines, right? Um, and and I know your story also. Uh, there's an inflection point. Our whole country uh, in 2014, after the killing of Michael Brown and and in the unrest in Ferguson, uh, was a pivotal moment uh, that's in a lot of minds and, and mouths today. Uh, and was also, if I understand like your work, it was another moment where just the, the sheer number of lawyers who weren't just part of the problem set or uh, the solution set, right, uh, were on yeah. the sideline. And, and, and this, this feels so relevant. I'd love to like what happened there for you and, and your work. Sure. Well, I mean, I think one thing I want to say is this idea of like, how, how do we understand the role of law in society? I think for me as a person who was now tasked with being the sort of, you know, the, the officer of the court, you, you take an oath and you're supposed to be representing the constitution. And I think for many of us that get these skills, you have to take a critical look at what, what has, how has law been utilized? And I say that as a precursor to the story because the, the reality is, is a lot of the system failure that we're seeing when we look at the system of policing, when we look at, uh, you know, the fact that housing is a commodity and it isn't a right, when we look at disparities in access to health care, education or jobs, these are all systems. And I think the reality is, is law as a tool has been, has been part of architecting those very systems, right? When we look at the history of policing in the United States, 
you know, it was actually legal to have slaves. It was legal to have Jim Crow segregation. And yes, we evolved that, but right. So in that sense, this idea that law is actually just a tool. And when you put it in different people's hands, it protects different interests. And so when, you know, what that, but the vast majority, I'll say the statistic, which I oftentimes share is that only 3% of America's lawyers, we have 1.3 million lawyers in America, only 3% of us work on issues of justice and poverty. And the truth is, is the vast majority of our profession is either sitting on the sidelines or actually actively in, you know, supporting um, corporations that are exploiting workers or, or you know, actually representing um, some of these bad actors. And so in Ferguson, you know, in 2014, when Michael Brown was killed um, as an unarmed black man in Ferguson, you know, I was a, a, a lawyer, at a national civil rights organization. And I went down to Ferguson and I was sort of just shocked by how few lawyers were willing to, uh, you know, very early on, I don't know if people re remember those days in 2014, but the, na the narrative in the media is quite complicated. Uh, you know, it was the looters and the rioters and there was sort of a complete um, lack of clarity that what was happening was a community was lamenting the loss of one of their children and and resisting this pattern of you know over a thousand unarmed people are killed by the police every year and i think it was a real aha moment for me that i felt like the legal community was slow to the pickup uh you know eventually we got there and but it took took a few a few legal organizations willing to say this is important we can use our legal <laughs> skills and and i guess the, the the thing you're referencing simon is some of us created an organization called law for black lives and we were able to get 3500 lawyers across the country to actually use their skills in service of the movement for black lives and so to me it was an indication that we actually have uh many of us are clear about these problems we just don't know how to be involved and we don't know how how to get in uh, particularly when i talk about lawyers that they didn't know how to get into it but if we built it they came and we we were able to use the help of four thousand lawyers to address what was happening across our country and those same lawyers are throwing down right now thank you pervy I, I, we're gonna there's also the Movement Law Lab, which is another engine to keep this work uh, growing and to address some of the systemic challenges in the field and also to tap the talent of lawyers, which is un under leveraged. I, I, we're going to circle back to that, but I want to bring Katie into the conversation, in part because, I mean, you teed up her work and maybe any Ashoka Fellows work really well in saying that there's, these are systems uh, that are, that are uh, oftentimes designed by humans or architects and Katie works in the food system uh, from f from afar it's absurd that people would live far from their food and yet in the neighborhoods that you work Katie uh, and in food deserts around the country that's the reality so help us understand your challenge like what what is this um, and it's and uh, in the spirit of the conversation we're having today the systemic roots of the challenge of food insecurity and food deserts desertification if you will across the country Yes. Hi, uh, Katie here uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> talking about uh, food insecurity in the food system, um, there are many issues. It's a health issue, it's an education issue, but it is absolutely a justice issue. Uh, communities with no grocery stores or prominently of low so socioeconomic status, people of color, they lack transportation and living wage jobs, uh, there's low home ownership, all the social determinants, we are interconnected with the ability to access affordable, healthy food. Um, and I just wanna say food deserts don't just happen. They, they didn't just pop up. It's a result of decades of disinvestment in our neighborhoods. Um, the lack of grocery store is just a symptom of the decay. And in order to uh, address that decay, we need to look at the deep economic and cultural forces in order to change that system. And we're seeing a lot of those right now coming to a head. Um, so I really feel from my standpoint, it's just, just not about giving people food or, or getting food to people. It's about positioning food security as an opportunity for community revitalization um, in these areas. Um, we want to promote local ownership of small grocery stores in order to generate wealth and keep those dollars flowing within their communities. We want to create jobs within their neighborhoods that, that, that they can bike and walk to and not have to leave their community to go to work, living wage jobs. 
Uh, we want to improve, improve health outcomes. You know, we did a study, you know, where you live in your zip code determines how long you're going to live. And our North Tulsa community, which is our food desert, if you lived in those zip codes, you live 14 years less than if you lived in another zip code in Tulsa. And that's just not acceptable. Um, so grocery stores are also a foundation and a corner store of a neighborhood. They are a traffic generator. They attract other businesses around them. They can be used as on-ramps for other entrepreneurial opportunities. And so what we see is, is building a framework that can address access to real food through a combination of a mobile grocery store, which we've been running for seven years. Um, we piloted some micro grocery stores inside senior living facilities and they worked really well. And just going again back to the, the COVID-19, um, this one particular facility had positive results within their apartment building and they were all on lockdown. Now these were elderly and disabled people. And so what we did is we, we had them call down to the store, which was located in their building, and we delivered directly to all their doors. So all 150 people were able to access, have been able to access and continue to groceries while we're in this pandemic. Um, but also uh, working through co-ops, which we're working on right now, we want to build a toolkit and, and uh, uh, really just a, a self startup kit for folks to open these mobile or micro grocery stores in their community. Um, they're very inexpensive to start up. We did our first one with $15,000. So the, the cost is, is low compared to um, large grocery stores. But we also have to address the, the access to wholesale distribution and some of the other barriers. So, you know, building a regional food hub and connecting them across the state, utilizing urban agriculture. Uh, we're working with our other partners that um, are building urban farms and teaching folks how to build urban farms. It's, a, it's great for those who may be justice involved because, you know, they can actually start their own business in their, in their own space. Um, and so that's really important. And then really just um, providing entrepreneurial opportunities for those living within those neglected areas. So we just want to completely rebuild the ecosystem of our supply chain and really bring it down to, to local. I uh, am such a fan of your work. I remember seeing a photo of one of the, the mobile grocery store and thinking it looks like a horse trailer. Uh, to, and you clarified it is a horse trailer, or it was, right? Uh, yes, yes, our first store was a horse trailer. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and yet, I mean, the, the, what it looks like today, the experience of it today with your neighbor running the shop, with music that you like playing, it's so clearly this, this uh, tool, this foundation for organizing, for community, for dignity. And so, we, I mean, I'm such a fan for all of those reasons. Um, and, and, and for that reason, I mean, you're making that piece, that playbook available to other, other folks elsewhere. Um, yes, we want to replicate it. We, want, we, don't want to, we don't want to hide what we're doing so nobody else can do it. We want everyone to be able to do this across the United States because um, you know, we, we, need to, we need to fix the food deserts. And, and if we're going to create equity and economic prosperity, these places need to have opportunities to access food. In a rely and it needs to be good food. I mean, we have food, you know, we have, you know, a food, you know, what do you call it? What do they call that? The fast food, you know, oasis, you know, there's food in every corner, but it's bad food and it's yeah. affecting people's health. And, you know, our, our community, you know, diabetes and heart disease and, and all of that is prevalent because there is no access to fresh, fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables. So we want to make sure that 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 is everywhere within our communities mm -hmm. and are locally owned. So we're creating and building wealth back into those communities, creating an opportunity for our neighbors and our residents to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and do for themselves instead of having to worry about other people doing for them. And I think that goes back to when you said dignity is a really important word to me. We need to do things in a dignified manner. I, you know, I've had folks ask me why we sell our food and don't just give it away. And that's the answer, it's dignity. Absolutely. People should have the right to come in and be able to purchase what they want when they want to. Thank you, Katie. Um, we, I, I feel like in the interest of time, we're not gonna to, uh, dig in to one particular point that I just also um, uh, so appreciate in your model. And that is a little bit 
uh, behind the scenes, it's that hub. It's the, it's the distribution center that can start to aggregate demand from small shops, from small locally owned grocers on a, on a level that can compete with the big box stores in the suburbs, right? And, uh, and, and so maybe I just said like the, the headline there. No, that's uh, Okay, good. Okay. Well, that's exactly it. And, you know, uh, we, we, we do, you know, we had rented a, a warehouse, which was going to become that food hub. And again, in, in just weird circumstances with the pandemic, um, we, we had the opportunity to quickly turn it into a food hub. And we are currently, uh, I guess we could say piloting its use by uh, putting out, we're feeding 900 families a week. Um, with grocery bags, and we have partnered with 15 different churches. So they come up every day and they pick up the groceries and they take it back to their neighborhoods because they know who who is in need mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing we've also been able to do is with our local farmers since our farmers market's been closed um, and they obviously have already grown this food and it's because it's you know picking time uh, we've been able to purchase from our local farmers and bring it into our food hub and then we're putting all that wonderful food into these grocery bags that are then going out into the communities that, that need it Thank you, Katie. I wonder if, if, if this theme of like the work that happens behind the scenes, it's often so uh, such a big part of the picture. And mm -hmm. to Daquan or to Pervy, uh, you know, we see movement lawyers showing up in, in such critical ways. We see young people popping up businesses on Zoom and elsewhere. Uh, but what, like, what should we know about behind the scenes? What's, uh, what is the overlooked or maybe surprising places that you all have intervened in the systems that you're uh, disrupting, that you're improving or changing? I don't know. The, the challenge is first, who understood the question in the way that I talked, <laughs> and then who wants to go first? <laughs> Pervy got, uh, uh, Pervy got me. Um, so one, you know, I'll just kind of start by making sure, um, you know, I touch on, you know, the behind the scenes are, are really who's always been behind the scenes, right? And so this is not necessarily like a new trend. Um, it's, it's one, the uh, community themselves, right? And so, you know, a big part of our work is really changing the way that leaders coming from um, what you could call disenfranchised, we really look to prefer underestimated. Um, coming from underestimated communities are identified as, right? And so how do we identify leaders coming from those communities? elevate them and support them. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things we're constantly focused on. Um, and really just to get directly to the point, Simon, I think um, they're the individuals taking charge right now in um, our communities right now, um, both from, you know, I think ways that we're seeing more visible right now with the protests. Um, but I think even before that and throughout, um, really being comprehensive in ways for their own communities and youth. So there's a big mental health push right now amongst after school networks across the nation right now. They operate at a statewide network. Um, that, that's a little also troubling because a lot of after school statewide networks will tell you that they're also at the same time because of COVID facing different budget cuts. Um, and they are the ones who are showing up to provide a lot of that mental health and support um, for youth right now. And so um, that's a big piece right there is just like the community itself and also those networks. And then the, the other small piece I'll mention as well, uh, well, small just as in tandem, but youth themselves, right? And so I think in every single pocket in the city, any city and coordinated effort that you see popping up right now um, has a youth led voice in it, right? And so um, here in New York City is Teens Take Charge. They, they in um, conjunction with a bunch of other, um, what you would call, what I call it, um, adult led organizations, let's say, um, you know, if we're going to have youth-led organizations, they, amongst teens take charge, actually um, reignited um, a lot of the, the summer youth work um, here in New York City. The, the original budget and program was canceled, um, and, and that organization, amongst a bunch of others, really stepped up. The same, same thing is happening in Los Angeles and a bunch of other cities. And so, again, I would say it's the same individuals. Is, is no one new that's, that's, that's in the, you know, the um, less visible spot that's not as visible right now. Um, and it's the community themselves who are from that community driving the solutions. And it's also the youth themselves who, um, who see things for what they are. Um, I think more oftentimes better than we do um, and are also taking leadership there um, where they can. And I, I think that's the other piece there is that not only who's taking backseat, but 
um, who is still being limited by the change they can continue to make if they were provided with the right resources um, now and going forward, right? I think we're focusing a lot on this particular moment in a lot of valid ways, but at the same time, um, a lot of all these things are not new. This happened pre-COVID. Um, this this unfortunately could be the case post-COVID, and so um, that's that's kind of what we're seeing. But at the same time, I think um, more than ever we're starting to see that progress for those communities, for those youth participants um, or, or youth leaders rather, who who are mm -hmm. starting to take those charge and, and getting a little visibility and, and support from their cities. Thanks, Daquan. Perby, you may yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I, there's so much I resonate with the way Daquan thinks about um, their work at, and, and particularly this idea of, you know, what's behind the scenes is oftentimes community leaders and community organizations and the visions and the imaginations there. And I think that's very similar for us on the law. So the vision that we have is to have lawyers be a part of social change. And the way we see that happening is by being partners, allies, and walking shoulder to shoulder with community members and community leaders that are oftentimes uh, trying to tackle the hardest things in their own lives, right? And so our vision for that is, you know, one, we have to understand um, the, pr the problem and we have to think about how law can be a, a tool in that. So what we do at the lab is we try to support lawyers to develop those skills, to understand social change, to understand grassroots organizing and then translate that in a very practical way into the day-to-day -day of lawyering. It's nice to have a politic. It's nice to, to sort of say something pithy, like I believe in social change or movements, but the day-to-day -day of how you take a problem that the law atomizes and says this one person is in an individual situation when in fact a community is going through it, how do you take that and work alongside people that are trying to build collective so solutions to what are collective problems? And so that's kind of what we train our lawyers to do. We particularly invest in lawyers that are coming from the communities that they're working in. Like, you know, there is a law is an incredibly undiverse field and the way people have used or the creativity with which we've used law or the types of fights that we've become a part of as lawyers are, are deeply biased by not actually having any lived experience um, of immigration challenges or ever being evicted or ever being stopped by the police or, or ever going a day without food. Um, and so we really believe that it's important to have legal leaders that are that this is a, a visceral understanding. And I've seen in my own life, like being coming from an immigrant uh, background, understanding the, uh, the challenges with immigration, understanding how people in my community were dealing with things like poverty or discrimination, deeply influenced my understanding, my sense of belief. You know, sometimes a lot of lawyers don't even believe what their clients are saying. And so I think that that is part of it. And I think the third thing is, is really, um, seeking to have transformative solutions, right? Like there are a lot of ways, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we can chip away at problems. And I think that's important. There's a harm reduction sort of strategy that law lawyers, especially many of us that come from public defenders offices or from legal services offices, you know, a lot of what we do has generally been very important for keeping people alive, keeping a roof over their head, keeping them out of a cage. But we're not actually, the vast majority of the work we do is sometimes not about transforming the root cause of that problem. And so how can we get, how can we get to this, the heart of what what is unjust about something and use legal skills in, in that way. Um, so anyways, there's more to say, but I think that that sort of mind shift for lawyers that then is practically turned into a model shift in your organization. What kinds of cases are you taking? What kinds of groups are you representing? What is success? Is success just litigating a case or is success transforming the problem? I think our vision is to have lawyers set a new barometer for what it means to be successful and that winning a case, we all know that we've won transformative civil rights cases and we and you know for example if we talk about education and kids we've won cases that said separate is not equal and yet our schools are just as segregated right now as they were uh, during the civil rights time and so this idea that law does not actually is not the sole fulcrum upon which change happens that we have to uh, attack it in a multidisciplinary fashion we have a couple of questions uh, coming in in the chat which i'm going to bring in uh, and we'll, so we'll have some time for those uh, soon. If other folks listening have any particular questions, maybe add them here. One thing I just want to uh, 
because I can and be, I'm greedy, I'll ask a question of you all it, based on a reflection. And, and the reflection is that something I find so compelling about all of your work is that you make it uh, so possible, almost irresistible, uh, to not fall in love with the possibilities that you showcase, right? The possibility of buying food right outside your door with music playing, your neighbors, you know, bumping shoulders, the possibility of having a, a maker, not a, not a maker space, but like a, a, a store in every high school or middle school in the country run by kids with, you know, opportunities flowing, uh, the possibility of taking this legal profession, which is so well resourced and taking those tools, you know, uh, for the benefit of all. And, and, uh, and so it's such a gift that you give us this. I'm going to ask you to sort of jump into like, to, to say, what are ideas that you're in love with, whether it's in your own or in your core community, but are there ideas that you're seeing that you just, you know, that, uh, that are irresistible and that you'd like to, to share, uh, unprompted so yeah I don't know and it can be your own it can be the thing that you're working on so like what's exciting and what's next in your own work is another fair way to answer that question I'll, I'll start I'm just I've been very excited I've been working in this field for a long time in in neighborhoods and, and where I live in these neighborhoods too um, you know we're we're the home of the the Black Wall Street and we've just celebrated not we didn't celebrate that was absolutely the wrong word we came together and actually protested um, on the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa 1921 race massacre. And what I am seeing in the last couple of years is our youth and our young leaders have been growing and are revitalizing our Black Wall Street and putting um, museums in and galleries and entrepreneur and starting jobs and just you know bringing back that entrepreneur spirit that used to be one of the most successful um, black neighborhoods in the United States. So that for me is seeing the youth really taking hold and taking the reins from the older leaders and stepping up and really making a difference it really makes me excited. Beautiful. Um, I would say what gives me, what excites me is the movement for Black Lives and the brilliant ideas that are coming out there about how we, how we divest from policing and we invest in our communities and all the creative ways that they're thinking about dealing with harm in society and, and community oriented ways of dealing with the challenges of conflict that are inevitable in a human society. I'm also really inspired by um, black farmers that are connecting to ancestral traditions and really seeing the land as both a place of stability um, and also a place of nourishment but also a, re a reconnection, a, a different or, you know, hands that worked those fields now feeling a different relationship to land. So Soul Fire Farm is, um, Leah Penniman who runs that has been a great inspiration um, to me. And then I think there's a bunch of um, creatives out there just, you know, mm -hmm. telling stories in new ways. Um, you know, I think these young people that are out there on the streets right now, I think I've, I've, I see just young people of all backgrounds are are so much wiser about the world and they've been exposed to so much more and that gives me great hope and possibility when our young people say i believe it can be different where it's more normalized to be a trans person coming out or to be uh in solidarity you know with others that are dealing with police violence like that kind of energy energy of we're in this together uh that is what gives me the most hope Yeah, and I would, I would honestly add a little more onto that, exactly what, um, you know, both Katie and Fergie I mentioned, right? And so we took all the good ones, which were, you know, really talking more about, um, I think in this moment, what's inciting me is just the strategic nature of, you know, how um, the more widespread movement is really growing, right? And so I think, like, um, while protests themselves may not be new, I think we're seeing this moment where um, one of the greatest value I feel of a protest is that it's a really great mechanism to activate and educate um, new individuals to that movement. And I think like this is an exciting moment for that. Generations are shaped by moments like these, right? And so I think like it's really exciting to had already seen the ways that um, this generation was already starting to, you know, implement um, and, and rebel against the things that they agree with and don't agree with. Um, and so that's what's really most exciting to me right now is just the deeper strategic nature of um, yes, you know, we have protests, but at the same time, we have um, solutions like um, 
Raheem.ai, Brandon Anderson. Um, he's doing some amazing work right now. Um, and long story short, they are building a publicly accessible, and it's not my work, so don't hold me accountable for not pitching it right. Um, but they are building a publicly accessible record of all um, police encounters throughout the nation, um, where if you are encountering a police officer, you can quickly log that within the chat bot, and that can be publicly accessible, used to identify cops who are, repetitive, who are repetitively harassing the community, et cetera, hold that police force accountable. Um, that is an amazing strategy, right? And I think um, strategy is comprehensive. Um, strategy is not just one thing. And I think at the same time as we're seeing things that I worked in the past really strengthen, um, we're also seeing the evolution of new complete tools and assets as well um, that will serve us throughout the next few years. So that's what's really exciting to me right now. Beautiful, I'm smitten myself. Um, folks, I actually just noticed there's a Q&A tab and a chat tab, and there are lots of questions, and so we don't have much time to get to any of them. Uh, Pervy, there's a, there are a group of questions around, like, how do you reach lawyers, and then maybe it's students, or maybe it's how people get on to the, uh, yeah, part, through partner organizations, but mm -hmm. like, you know, and maybe against the backdrop of, you're like one of America's best kept secrets, right? So uh, like now you have a chance to tell us how folks can connect with your work and how you're doing that in a systematic way. Sure, I mean, I, I think um, there are a couple of questions that I saw just around like, how do people get connected? I mean, I, I think the way we speak to lawyers is oftentimes in moments like this. I, I think these moments are actually places and times, whether you look at the child migrant crisis or this moment, where I think a lot of lawyers are looking around wondering, like, what could we be doing? So we oftentimes, if there are, if you are a lawyer or you know of lawyers that want to volunteer, they can do that. Um, they can sign up for our our email list serves and connect with the Movement Law Lab. And, and we do a lot of work to help train people up. We're training lawyers right now on this eviction crisis and how we're about to face 30 million evictions in this country. And we're also deploying lawyers around Law for Black Lives. So if you connect with us, and I think someone asked a really good question of, you know, it's not just a concept, it's a how. And so part of what the lab does is we provide that sort of scaffolding around a lawyer or a law student that's trying to work in this way. So there's a lot of opportunities for training, for being in a community of practice you know social justice is long-haul work there's no it's not like you get the formula you say law plus organizing and then you got it for the rest of your career you need to be in 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 authentic conversation with people that are struggling to use law in in a way that is transformative so we build those communities of practice we also uh, support uh, lawyers if you know um, if lawyers are actually trying to build a new legal organization that has a sort of social change approach in its DNA, we support those organizations through an incubator. So there's a lot of different ways that our organization um, wants to support and is ready to help lawyers that are willing to do this work kind of take their ideas and, and grow. Perfect. Uh, Daquan, any questions about like how schools may be forever changed, if that's energizing to you? Katie, questions about, you know, the way your work is spreading and, and the relevance across the country and we have like a minute left. So um, I, I don't know, I feel like maybe I just have to call it, uh, but uh, in part because what we're gonna do, this is uh, this Inside Ashoka as all Inside Ashokas are really put together as a way to help our community connect. Uh, and so we will be sharing these questions that have come in as well as contacts of folks who participated with you, Katie, Daquan and Pervy. Uh, and I, I just, I'm, so I'm going to take the last minute just to thank folks um, who joined uh, you all first and foremost for sharing your time and your stories with us for all the people who joined uh, this afternoon online um, and for all of our supporters of Ashoka who make all of our work possible, including conversations like these um, in that spirit of generosity. Uh, if folks have particular ideas, uh, particularly leads to funders, media contacts, possible connections for Katie Pervy or Daquan. You could share those with us. We'd be happy to pass those along. Um, we really, you know, we, by, by partnering with and supporting these Ashoka Fellows and all Ashoka Fellows, we're betting on a better and brighter future. And so um, thank you all for joining and really uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. And yeah, maybe we'll, yeah, without mute, you guys can get the last audio. We'll, goodbye, Pervy, Katie, Daquan, thank you so much. Really appreciate you all and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, all.
then that's it. Oh yes, and next up, <laughs> I forgot to mention, on the 17th, we get four more new fellows uh, to meet. So if you're still on the line, make sure you sign up for that one as well. Thanks, Daquan, Pervy. I'm gonna sign off now. Adios.